Welcome to all of our listeners. And now we will get started with our speaker today, Hazel Kedel. She's going to be sharing with us her presentation about keeping our passion alive as midwives. It's with great pleasure that I share with you about Hazel. She is Hazel Kedel is a lecturer of midwifery at the Western Sydney University and a PhD candidate. Hazel has worked in midwifery group practices, an Aboriginal medical service, a variety of hospital settings, and as a privately practicing midwife in both city and regional locations. Hazel's passion for VBAC followed her own experience of having a VBAC with her daughter in 2008. And since then, she has published research on women's experiences of having a home birth after cesarean and her PhD D work is on exploring women's experiences of planning a VBAC in Australia. Hazel loves her role as a lecturer of midwifery and midwifing the midwives of the future. Wonderful, Hazel, welcome. It is so wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you for being a part of this virtual day of the midwife. Thank you very much for that. Um, Yes, I am a midwife and I am a lecturer. And I first did this presentation at a student midwife conference um, at our national conference last year in Canberra. And it was a lot of fun to give. So I'm very excited to, to give this again. It is based for um, student midwives, but I think really as a midwife anywhere in your career, it's nice to get a bit of a, a boost and maybe some tips on you know, what, what you can do to keep your own passion alive. Um, I'm just wondering how I go through the slides. Apologies. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, no, I can, I've got it now. Yeah, excellent. You've got it? Perfect. Yep, I have. Okay, so I've got about 10 top tips to go through and just a few little stories and pictures to go, um, to go with them. So my first tip uh, for student midwives was to learn on the go. If you want to learn more about an area of midwifery, go and work in it. So midwifery, like nursing really, midwifery can be very varied. You know, we can work in the antenatal period, we can work in hospitals, we can work in childbirth education, we can work on labour wards, midwifery group practice. Um, and, and because it's so varied, we can very quickly get comfortable in the area that we're working. But I think it's actually, if you get an interest in something, rather than just going, well, it's not my area and you know, I'm, I'm just gonna read up on it maybe, it's actually better to just dive straight in and start and work in that area. And by working in it, that's the way that you're gonna learn more about that area. I certainly did this for the whole of my nursing and midwifery career. And I started nursing when I was only 19. And any area I was unsure about, I just would go and take a job in it. I started off in emergency nursing. And I never really understood the whole um, intubation thing. You know, we used to get these wonderful anesthetists that would come along and stick these tubes down these patients and then they would connect them to this amazing machine that goes beep and kept them alive. I didn't really understand much about it. So after a couple of years and thinking I need to experience something else, I thought I need to go to intensive care. I don't understand these ventilators. I want to go and find out what it's all about. And so I went and I learned on the go. I then spent a bit of a time doing a, a bit of a crazy job in the, in the islands of Indonesia, which is really fun. And I worked with, with professional divers who were doing uh, marine biology research. And I was that got me interested in hyperbaric medicine because I had to learn about diving and I became a rescue diver, I did all these amazing dives. So when I then moved to Australia, I thought, well, there's a hyperbaric centre here, I'll go and work there. And so I learned about hyperbaric medicine through going to work in it. I always wanted to be a midwife. It took me a little, it took me about 10 years of, of nursing until I was ready to do midwifery. And what I did, it, you know, I followed the same kind of field. When I qualified, I wanted to, to become more of an expert midwife in low risk women. So I got a job in a low risk maternity unit rather than staying in the high risk maternity unit that I had trained in. I really wanted to do home birth and uh, and how I kind of accidentally fell into home birth is probably one that a few home birth midwives have when all of a sudden you're getting a phone call and, and you turn up and, and, and you're there at a home birth. Um, I also wanted to learn about Aboriginal health. It's an area that, that you know really interested me and I understood 
the 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 challenges were so different from the challenges we were seeing in the hospital and i was lucky enough to be able to work for a year in an aboriginal um medical service and i learned so much from the women that that i worked alongside and that i was a midwife for so i really think you know to keep that in mind like if it's something that you've got an interest in maybe it's gestational diabetes or maybe it's high risk or maybe it's um working with um women who who are going through cancer therapy like if there's something specific or even more broad then jump in and give it a go so that's my first tip my next tip is a little bit challenging in our COVID-19 era um, but to stay up to date attend conferences and be engaged with social media and I did put this slide up with some of the ones that we're going to go ahead um, this year but unfortunately they've been put back obviously we've got the ICM channel conf congress which is now going to be next year um, but you all kind of can tick that box box already because you're here you're here at the virtual international day of the midwife which i have been attending and speaking and facilitating at for many years and it's one of my favorite um, events of the year so by staying up to date though and going coming to those conferences you you're getting to meet people who are passionate like you you're getting to hear about the current research that's out there or the ideas and the models of care that are a little bit different to your own and when you're in your work and you're there every day and things can be challenging, then you're stepping out of that and actually being alongside other midwives, other researchers who are passionate about midwife can have such a major effect. The other with that is being engaged in social media and with social media. Um, my uh, dear friend and supervisor, Professor Hannah Darlin, her Facebook page is fantastic. She's up there and she's always sharing um, good information. There's also Twitter and Instagram. Um, here's a UK um, fantastic midwife researcher, Dr. Sarah Wickham is another example, but there are many out there um, to follow. And I think that's an important part of it. You know, your Facebook feed shouldn't just be all about your, your friends and your family. You know, you should also be tapping into um, what are the current thinkings and what are the, the current challenges um, for midwives and not limiting it to what is normal for you, like what's going on in other countries as well. Um, I follow a, a fantastic midwife from, from Nepal and I love to see the, the comments and the, um, the information that she brings up um, to make me really think and make me challenge about my viewpoint here in Australia as an Australian midwife. Um, the ICM Triennial Congress, if, for those of you that are able to, to get along to any, just try and make it a, uh, a life goal to be able to make it to one of them. And hopefully at some point it will come to an area um, near you that you can then attend because it really is the Olympics of midwifery. It's a beautiful event to see all these midwives at the opening ceremony carrying their flags. Um, I've been to one so far and I am going to be going to the Bali one and, and it just it really infuses me and it just keeps me going uh, for those next few years when you're having challenging times in your work. So that was my second one, stay up to date, attend conferences and be engaged with social media. My next tip um, is remove your blinkers and look at the opportunities around you. And I've got some beautiful photos here. Last year, I was very lucky to be able to take uh, nine student midwives, so Bachelor of Midwifery students from Western Sydney University over to Nepal, where we worked alongside um, some amazing charities that went out into the Chitwan um, area, into the Chapang Hills, and to some other rural areas where there was very limited antenatal um, care. And we really learned, you know, the stories of the women and, and what they went through. Um, we also took some days for girls kits out there, which, which are gratefully received and we also worked with student with um the the nurses over there uh, who who were doing midwifery we learned a lot about midwifery in Nepal and for my students it was amazing to see their their whole worldview change around midwifery to realize that midwifery was so much more than what they were doing in their home hospital and with the women that they were seeing or in their local community that actually midwifery is an international profession and something that we you don't understand until you're there and experiencing it and realizing that the women although they may have different challenges to you and um, they 
still go through the same processes that you do um, and are really grateful for you to be there. And the difference, a small difference, we were only there for three weeks, but the small differences that can make. In one particular village, we met the traditional midwife whose mother was the traditional midwife and then now she's the traditional midwife. And she was hungry for knowledge. She would just soak it up. She sat in the clinic alongside me and um, you know, she would present the women who were, who were pregnant and tell me all their stories and they would tell me their stories. And then with a student, we would do um, an antenatal clinic. And I honestly think I learned more from, from her than she learned from me. Um, but then a few weeks later, or maybe even a month or so later, we, we got sent a photo from one of the charity, charity staff over there um, where she was hugging some women that we had met uh, who were pregnant and they're holding their babies and she wanted to share that, share that information with her. Uh, with us and to show that um, she was so grateful for, for the small information that we shared with her. But now the students that are now graduated midwives, and I'm very, very proud of them, have got that from the beginning of their career onwards. And there are lots of opportunities out there. It's not just our, our university. Many universities um, have programs like this where you can go and experience this. But also as a qualified midwife, you can as well. It doesn't have to be just uh, an experience as a student midwife. See what's out there. Um, there are so many different opportunities. There are Facebook groups such as Volunteer Midwife is a really good one that you can tap in and go, you know, well, where can I help and where can I serve? And what, where, what can I do and what can I learn about midwifery? And if you're stagnant in what you're doing right now and you just want inspiration and an opportunity, obviously once international travel is allowed again, then it might be, this might be your time to go, you know, I need to go to a different place and to get that passion for midwifery back again. Okay, that's that. So well, let's on to my next one, which is make plans for your careers. There's a bit of a boring slide, this one. Um, but I, you know, I give this across to student and midwives because um, there's often a bit of a groan at this point and my, my pug just snored like a big groan. Um, because they hope, they're hoping that at the end of the three years, that's it, that's the end of their study. They don't need to do any more assignments. And then I'm kind of a bit rude and I go, well, actually, it's, that's, this is just the beginning of your study. You know, being a midwife, you are a lifelong learner now. But it's important to be, I think, be aware of what it is that you're going to do and have some plans. Now, those plans can change. And this year has shown us that many, many plans will change and they can change really quickly. But they, you can still be moving towards what you want to do. So in Australia, we have this um, role called an eligible, uh, an endorsed midwife, um, which means that you can get endorsed to, to write prescriptions and um, order ultrasounds and diagnostics, and, and you need to be endorsed to be able to provide home birth services. But it's not something that just happens overnight. You don't just go, okay, I'm, I've been a postgraduate for, for three years now and I can now be a home birth midwife. There's actually a lot of planning that's involved with that. You know, there's a, there's a course that you need to do at university. Um, there's certain experiences that you need to have. There's certainly hours that you need to build up. So that's why I talk about, you know, make some plans for your career. Where do you want to be in five years' time? What area of, of midwifery do you want to be working in? And what do you need to do to get there? You know, is it home birth midwifery? Is it, um, is it midwifery group practice? You know, is it um, working in high risk care? You know, what is it that you want to do? And then what do you need to do to get there? Also be aware that, you know, not all courses lead to the same point. If you, if you think in the future that maybe research is something that might interest you, and believe me, I, I never thought that at all, and now I'm right at the end of my PhD. Um, and I love research, like just get me started on research and I could just talk all day. But if, if that is something that you're interested in, then, you know, touch in, touch base with a researcher or, or a, an academic and say, what do I need to do to get there? Because you'd be surprised, but you know, not all postgraduate courses will actually lead you in the pathway that you want to go to, but they often sound very good on paper. So just be critical about the, what you're going to be doing. All right, your next one is, um, oh, well, I've kind of covered a little bit of this already, but take further education seriously and be smart about what you choose to study. Like I said, they don't all lead to the same um, pathway. And look at the credentials of the university um, that you're looking at, that you're wanting to go to as well. 
And I can see Lara has just said she wants to become a lactation consultant. Um, and exactly. So look at well, what is it that you need to do to do that? And what are your steps that you need to do to get that? Um, and then what do you actually need to be a uni lecturer? The best way to find that out is to contact one that's in your area. My other little comment about um, universities, and this can be really for any course, is if you're going to choose a university, unless you're very restricted because of where you live and there's only one that you can go to, but with so many online options these days, where are the experts in the field working? Because that's often going to be a very inspired university to go and work at. If they're a name, if they're, if they're publishing, if they're you know, good researchers and they're inspiring leaders, then they've probably got an inspiring team that they're working alongside and it's that team that are going to be teaching you and they're designing the course that you're doing so really have you know don't just go well this is the course i want to do it looks fantastic do a little bit of digging who's working there like and do you know those names or you know you read this amazing piece of research well what's that person doing and where do they teach i think it makes a really big impact especially when you're then looking if you are looking at doing research because that makes you very critical about who you want to be on your team This is a bit of a serious one. Don't let the bullies win. And even more important, don't become a bully. I have in my midwifery career, unfortunately, been bullied. And it was severe. It was kind of in secret. I don't really think that the staff members I was working alongside really knew the level um, that I was being bullied by management. I don't think they really saw the impact of it. But the impact on me was huge. I had a period of, um, of illness. Um, I had to go on, on stress leave. Um, and then once I applied to go on to stress leave through a workers and health and safety compensation, I was told by the manager who was doing the bullying that that would never get through, that I would never get paid for that. Um, it was a really difficult time for me, um, being bullied yet being passionate about what you want to do and yeah it's it's really horrible and we have lost so many midwives to the profession and probably midwives lives that because bullying has has become so difficult to live with when going to work makes you feel sick when driving to work makes you choose think about choosing between driving to work and choosing a tree to drive into it is serious and we don't take it seriously enough. Um, and it's really, the, the, the thing I say about don't become a bully, it's actually easier, isn't it, to kind of follow the flow than it is to stand up against it. I mean, if you can hear a bunch of um, colleagues and midwives sitting around going, you know, that, you know, that new student, God, she's such a pain. And, you know, she just, she never does anything right. And oh, the way that she speaks to women and, and then other and then other people are joining in. Oh no, she was terrible. She was so horrible. And you know, her, her just her English language skills aren't that great. And oh, no one can ever understand what she's saying. It just becomes insidious. And everyone kind of joins in because you want to be part of that group. I assume. I don't I don't get it because I've I've never been able to do that, but I know that some people do. It's probably harder to step in and say, I don't think that's a conversation you should be having. But I actually think that is what we should be doing. We need to call it out. We need to call it out and say, that is bullying. And you cannot speak like that. And often when you point that out to somebody, when you actually point that out in front of the group that they're saying all that information to, that's enough to nip something in the, bed, in the bud that could have escalated so much more. I had a beautiful story of a, um, a student recently who um, was taking a hand over so so the the woman had come up with a, another midwife from from having her baby in labor ward up to the postnatal ward and as the student was taking a hand over from the midwife the midwife started talking badly about a student which seems a bit crazy to say that to another student but still they were talking badly about a student and that student who was taking the hand over called it out and said, I don't think that's professional, the way that you're speaking to me, and I don't think it's fair. And that stopped it. And that stu other student found out about it and in a positive way then felt that there was someone there with her, with, with her back and someone there that was supporting her. We don't like to talk about this ugly, 
ugly um, area of bullying, but it happens. For me, um, I moved out of the area and uh, actually, you know, my, my home birth midwifery business went skyrocketing that year when I decided to go, that's it, I'm not coming back to be bullied by you. But during that period of time, there was one shift and I won't forget it. And a beautiful um, student, student midwife was working. I'd done a few births with her. And I was in the in the storeroom looking for something, and I was a little bit upset about something somebody had said that day. And this student midwife came in, and she pushed the door closed, and she said to me, "Look, I don't really know what's going on right now with you, but I know that something is, and I know that you're really upset, and I know that you're not the midwife you used to be because you're so because something is happening. But I just need to let you know that because of the birth that I did with you, that's the reason I'm still a student midwife." and that you are an amazing midwife, and I just want you to know that. And I still remember that. Like, it still gets me choked up. It made such a difference to my life. I went home and I thought, okay, this is this is an issue with these people that are bullying me and not with everyone else that I'm working with, and I can still make a positive impact to midwifery. I was very lucky to see her a few years later, and I actually thanked her for doing that and told her what an impact that made to my life. So even if you're not the one being bullied and you're not the one being a bully, but you know it's happening, maybe just reach out. Reach out and give a hug or a verbal hug and just say, you know, I don't know what's happening, but I care for you and I'm sorry. Okay, moving on. Okay, so if you have an experience that gives you more questions than answers, then explore it. Uh, this is a woman here having an amazing, and she loves me sharing her, her picture, um, having a VBAC after two cesareans at home. VBAC gave me a lot of questions. I had a VBAC of, of my own in 2008, and it left me with more questions than answered. Questions such as, I feel so fantastic right now. Is this just me because I've pushed a baby through my vagina? Or do other women who've had a VBAC feel like this as well? That was one of my questions. One of my other questions was, I had a really hard time in labor. I was being pushed around. I was being told I needed to go for a cesarean. Um, it was a real, I had real challenges with other healthcare providers whilst I was in labor. I was being told when I had a vagina, whilst I was having a vaginal examination, that they'd had a rupture recently when the baby had died. And that, and I was in a very obviously compromised position. And that made me question, well, I'm a midwife. They knew me at that hospital. They knew that I was a midwife and that's how I got treated. How would any other woman without that knowledge ever have a VBAC? And what are their experiences like? Those questions really catapulted me into becoming a researcher and, and publishing on VBAC and spending you know, the last 11 years really focusing on women's experiences of planning and having a VBAC in Australia. If you get that burning desire of a question, and it might be a small question, it might be a big one, it might be something you've personally experienced or something that you've observed, then go and do something about it. It could just be reading a, reading a paper and learning more about the topic. It could be something more than that. It could be setting up local support groups. Um, it could be looking at uh, turning that into a research question and doing you know, a higher, higher research degree in that area. It could be that you end up becoming an expert in that area um, just because you had a niggle and you had something, you know, really a burning question that you wanted to go and, and follow. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my tip here. Um, really, if you if you've got those questions, go and find out what those answers are. I don't know if you can hear my pug snoring in the background, but at least it's better than him barking. It's hilarious. Okay, this is a um, uh, this is another tip for me. Give continuity of care a go. <laughs> Thanks, Red. Um, we all know um, continuative care, midwifery continuative care is the gold standard of care, but we don't all get to experience it either as a woman or as a midwife. But why is that? Why don't we do that? So it might just be the fact that it's not available in your area. You know, you're, you, you cannot move to, to a different area and in your area, there are no midwifery continuative care models. Well, what can you do? Or maybe you can get a bit behind the scenes and find out why there isn't. And what, what is there that you can do to maybe start suggesting that um, your area needs to have contingent care models? But maybe it's because you're scared about doing it. If you're, a, um, if you're a new graduate midwife, you might think, well, I don't have enough experience yet. Well, if that's the, if that's the case, maybe 
just go and have a chat with the midwifery group practice in your area and ask them what they what you need to be able to work as a um, as a group practice midwife or or in a contingent care model and then you can go back to one of those further um, preceding slides which said you know plan for the future now that you know that you need x amount of um years before you can do it then you can plan for that and what do you need to do in 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 that time but if you've already got it, all the credentials you need to work in it but you're worried that it the lifestyle isn't for you or you don't want to be on call um or it's going to be too much of an impact for your family then they're all just questions that you're not going to know until you give it a go it can be absolutely um challenging i have done some amazing um birthing and family responsibilities in the same day i remember driving when i was a private midwife driving i had a woman who had a baby about three hours away from me and it happened to be my daughter's birthday um and red can relate because red had to had to say that she she was unsure whether she could make this session today because of the same issue but it's happening you're, like, you're on call you just never know when it's going to happen and I drove all the way for three hours. I made this birth um, and the birth was fantastic. And I'm driving back and I knew that um, the party that we'd arranged for her, my husband was working, so I was the only one that could do this party. The party started at four o'clock that afternoon because people, kids were coming after school. And I rarely had birthday parties for my kids. I feel very sad for them because it was such a nightmare to ever organize. But I had this one planned and I managed to get back by about, half past three and from about half past three onwards and you know i've been gone from the night before i was baking like crazy and everyone turned up at four o'clock and uh and to my dismay all the mums just sat around and uh, and watched me as i'm going crazy trying to prepare bake all these cakes and stuff but luckily we had a we had a um, bouncy castle in the backyard and they all just went and uh all the kids went and jumped on that while i continued getting the food together sometimes uh it's 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 a near miss sometimes you do miss things all together but on the whole big scheme of things there are other things like you only get called out during the night when women are in labor and they're women that you've got a relationship with and you don't mind you get excited and you're pumped and you get there much quicker than you're expecting to um, rather than you know those endless night shifts where you know you're, you're you're trying to find yourself things to do um and they're really hard to do so i guess if you haven't done it before and you're worrying about doing it just give it a go you just don't know how amazing it will be Midwifery mean, midwife means with woman, and I think you really don't get that until you've given contingent care a go. Remember your why, and this is something I'd love you to share on here. When you're a student, um, we often ask them on the first day, you know, why do you want to be a midwife? We might ask them in an interview before they even start, why do you want to be a midwife? And you know it at that point. And often by the end of your three years or four years, however long your um, degree is, you may forget what it, why it was that you wanted to become a midwife. So I suggest you try and tap into why it was and write it down and have that somewhere for you to remember. Because there are times when you have a really hard shift or you have had an argument too many at work or you've looked after a really distressing uh scenario that there can be days where you need to be reminded of what your why was so if you can think of it right now feel free to share it in the public chat if you feel like it's something you can share because uh, i think there'll be so many different ones and i thought about this morning you know what what is my why um and through my nursing i always knew i, I loved women's health and i wanted to work in women's health and i wanted to be um an autonomous practitioner that could work alongside women during their pregnancy and i think that's really what led me into being a midwife that and my and my granny being a midwife and telling me i was going to be one um but there are so many different ones and I, I think it's so important to keep your why nearby so that you can check in on it on the times that you're having a bad day so cecilia shared that she's a midwife because the best birth because the best birth possible is the best start for the new family. That's true, like we make such a difference to women's lives and to families' lives. Um, and uh, yeah, we can never really, um, we can't be replaced, midwives can't be replaced. We have such an important job to do. Oh, I've got a whole load of ones coming through. 
<laughs> oh, so Sarah O'Connor is a beautiful woman who's just put a comment on there. We wrote a chapter together um, in the in the new book, um, Canary in the Coal Mine. And uh, Sarah shared her HVAC story, which I'll tell you whenever I read it, her home birth after her own story, I still get teared up. And so she wants to be an advocate for women like she experienced with her home birth with private midwives. Absolutely, Sarah. I can absolutely understand. And I'm so excited that you're in the in the field now as a student midwife. It's so exciting. And Red says there's nothing more magical than being a part of first breaths for babies and also new mums. That's right. It is absolutely amazing to do our while. I'll let you keep typing that while I continue. Oh, my final one, be kind to yourself. And um, I think really important right now um, because we are um, in such a difficult time and, you know, my, my hearts and, and mind go out to you midwives who are working on the front line right now with the whole COVID-19 crisis. You need to spend some time to be kind to yourself. And so I shared some, some silly pictures there. There's the picture of the pug that's been snoring in the background. Um, my kids and my husband, we play board games. And um, that's kind of what we like to do when we go for walks um, with the dog. And that's my way of, you know, kind of being kind to myself and being taking some time out of, of the, the stressful job, the wonderful job of being an academic midwife, but um, it still has its, has its moments. And yes, this is what we do. So really think, what is it that you do to be kind to yourself? And if you are a student midwife right now in the middle of study, you may have thrown everything out of the window that you ever did to be kind to yourself. You don't have the time to juggle other things on top of um, getting your assignments done, doing your shifts uh, and getting to and get into university. I understand that, but maybe you need to rekindle some of those. I get it. I've been doing a PhD while working full time and with a, with a, a very amazing but busy family. Um, you still need to have some time to get out there um, and and just carve it for yourself. And whether that's family time or your own me time, as long as you feel that that time is being kind to yourself. I have a quick look. Um, and there Ruth said she had okay care for her first baby, but knew that midwives can be amazing. And I wanted to be like she was and to have as much passion for my job. That's true. We really do have a good passion. Um, Nikki has started exercising again, life-changing, absolutely. Um, and then uh, Rihanna says, I'm studying because I would feel privileged to be able to support, empower, and educate women to achieve a positive birth experience. The career is dynamic, exciting, and ever-evolving. Mm. It certainly is ever-evolving. It's very challenging. Um, job to do. So that's kind of my little 10 top tips. I hope you found them useful. Um, and even if you just remember one or two of them, then, um, you know, that, that might be something that's good for you. But the most important one I think I've put at the end is to be kind to yourself. But I'm loving all the comments. I've loved all the, the ways that all the, the why, the whys you've become a midwife and uh, really hold on to those. And that's something that we can all learn from too. And then just my very last slide is one of the other things I do is I have a little um, Hazel Kittle VBAC researcher. One of the things I want to do to give back to women is to just put these little videos together about VBAC research. There's only about four or five on there at the moment. I will do some more once I've finished all my big writing. Um, but feel free to go and find me there um, at VBAC Matters where I put these little educational um, short animation videos for women to use and for yourselves as midwives and other healthcare professionals to um, concisely understand what the VBAC research is, is out there saying. And I think that's me done. And there's my contact details. Amazing. Thank you, Hazel, for sharing all of that. Um, I love so many of your tips. I think they all resonated with me so much. There's parts of your story that I can definitely relate to as well. Um, so we have time now to be able to open up to questions from our delegates and participants. If you want to speak to Hazel, you um, are welcome to, or you can type them into the chat as well. I love what you were bringing in about um, the bullying. I think sometimes we don't talk about that enough. And it's something that for me as a midwife has always baffled me where I feel like so many of us get into the 
profession because we feel so passionate about um, supporting women during these you know powerful vulnerable times of pregnancy and birthing to not be to not be bullied um, and yet you know we forget about that part for ourselves and also for our sisters so it's it's a really Absolutely. powerful yeah and you know the 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 term of, the term of you know the midwives eat their young like that's that that's not fair because often the young ones then won't come through um you know we really need to support our students um that are going through a really challenging time um and i really you know i really cherish our students i love midwifing the midwives of the future but i hear their stories and it's um it's challenging what they go through it really is and then it's almost you know, if they have a really hard time they might not even realize it but they then do the same to the next lot of students coming through as well rather than fostering a, a, an environment of supporting each other you're just fostering an environment that just bullies the next person and just creates bullies in this cyclical um process yeah it's really true i love the self-responsibility oh, we have a we have a question here how do i keep my fire burning when they're telling me i'm going to be I'm going to be miserable with this career choice. So being working with midwives who present a negative view of the profession. That is really challenging. Um, and, you know, you, you would, you'd hear this a lot. I heard this a lot in nursing as well as in midwifery. You know, or you wouldn't want to be do that. You wouldn't want to do this job. Um, I think that's where you look at some of these other things, like look at what else is out there. You know, what can you do as a student that would be different to where you are right now? And you can actually tap in with, with midwives who are excited. Is it, in looking at you know saving up and looking at an overseas trip at some point where you can work in 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 a different area with midwives who are passionate or is it as simply you know actually thinking during your three years who has been a passionate midwife who who has made an, an impact to you Alison and then asking them if they could be your mentor you know actually I'm having a really difficult time right now I have all these midwives of negative attitudes but you seem to be different could you could you help me you know could I could you be a mentor for me and so that you have someone that you can bounce off um, and that can that can negate those experiences for you, you know, like can actually balance it out for you. So that might be something you look at. And if you can't find that for many of your own experiences, then, you know, connect with other midwives, either at conferences like this um, or online and find somebody that, you, you know, you really appreciate online and, and let them know and keep conversations going with that as well. And you can tell from on here, there's a whole lot of passionate midwives on here. I'm absolutely passionate in, in midwifery. I love it. I think it's the, the, the most life-changing and impacting work that we can do as women. Um, and it's, you know, it really pushed me into realize how important feminism is in midwifery. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we need to be supporting and advocating for women, but also for ourselves and for our colleagues. Yeah, it's so true. I think having the courage to change out of the scene, if we can, to, to move on to something that is more positive and supporting for us is so essential because the burnout rate is so high for midwives. So I see so much also with student midwives, sometimes because of the influences um, going on in their surroundings with their preceptors or whatever is, is so negative that the burnout happens even before they finish school it's just so tragic yeah. absolutely absolutely and um, and then you know then you think well what is it in that area or in that in that department or in on that ward or in that unit that's making it negative mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be like that and if it's not mm -hmm. not something that you can identify and that you can um you know come up with suggestions with then you're not losing if you if you leave I know when yeah. when midwives are feeling are feeling bullied and going through um going through bullying, often you think if I leave, then they've won. But what have mm. they won? They will just find somebody else to bully. You, what yeah. you're trying to keep is your own self esteem and you know your your own self respect. And there is you know there is nothing wrong with leaving a situation and finding it somewhere else because mm. just what. The, the door that you close and then the door that you open might just lead you to opportunities that you never knew were there.
Mm. And this is exactly what we share with the women that we work with as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so we say that you can say no. Own, yeah, we need to take our own advice a little more sometimes. Absolutely. So yeah. We have a few more minutes for the questions, so please um, go ahead and continue. To comment here. B BG said. Um, to Alison, who made that comment about the negative midwives, I've gone through mm -hmm. the same thing. I kept going back to my why and the initial people who inspired me to choose midwifery. Yeah, really important. And yeah. Tammy's um, important point there, you don't need to you don't need to socialise with them. So if they're negative people, don't let that leak into your social life as well. Try and find mm -hmm. like-minded people um, mm -hmm. that would be cho your choice of friends out of work hours. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they are there because we're all here. Um, if you're a very negative midwife, you wouldn't bother to come on to here and listen to this. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Find your, find your support. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love um, your third tip that you brought in about all of the amazing avenues that we have to expand in as midwives. It's one thing that keeps it so exciting for me. Um, you know, I did uh, training. Uh, sort of 10 years into my career as a biodynamic cranial sacral practitioner. So all the potential of body work to, you know, so many modali modalities like reflexology or yeah, like lactation and so many things that we can just keep on adding to our to our list of services that we can that we can support women absolutely and, moms. Yeah. and it's not always always doesn't always have to have the title midwife in it you know it's something yeah. that you can bring in you know especially in all of the thinking about all the alternative and therapeutic mm -hmm. um services that are out there and what you can do to to bring those in um and how that can then impact your midwifery practice and then you can use that to educate other midwives too so yeah there's mm -hmm. um there's so there's so much out, out there no education is is wasted before I became a nurse and I, before I became a midwife whilst I was um, sort of nursing I did become a, um, a certified aromatherapist and a massage mm -hmm. therapist and certainly you know in my midwifery times with women they they were very helpful um, skills to have and knowledge to have with women so yeah there's a lot out there that you can learn. Yeah, and I was curious to ask you also if you knew that research um, was your thing early on. So it was interesting to hear you say in your presentation that that kind of found you more than you knowing. Yeah, that absolutely. Like, I, do, right? I do remember um, in one of the courses I did before I became a midwife, there was a research um, unit to it. And, and there were things about it that kind of interested me. And I got to kind of put a proposal together, but it didn't really you know, really captured me, didn't make me think, oh, I want a career in this at all. So it was more, um, you know, having these questions and wanting to find out more about these questions and then actually going to somebody with those questions. So I actually had um, had a unplanned um, run, a meeting with a uh, Professor Hannah Darling once in a, in a, at a community forum where I shared my story about my feedback and she listened and she's like, you know, you could do research in that. And then, uh, you know, looking into that and, and going down that path of what that meant. But I'm really glad that that it was somebody like Hannah that I, I bumped into and I had that conversation with because she really understood the pathways to get there. Uh, so, you know, that's something I would add. You know, if you, if you think, you know, maybe this is research or maybe this is writing a book or this is, you know, doing this online course, reach out to, to really good people who understand the process. Um, it saves a lot of time and angst, I think. And it's such a good reminder that the more we put ourselves out there, the more chances are that we have that so-called chance meeting with someone who might really just alter the course of our career. Um, Absolutely. So that's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, well, I look forward to maybe we can meet in person at the ICM, the Olympics. Oh, that'd be Olympics. wonderful. Said. I loved that. Um, yeah, I'm planning to be there as well. I was disappointed to miss it this year, but never mind. We, we try next year again.